Hi, and welcome to Fresh Waves. I'm your host, Bren Masson. Today, we're talking with Kelly Talon Franklin. Kelly is a best-selling author, uh, a human trafficking survivor. She's with the Business and Professional Women of Canada, Vice President Communications. She's with Business and Professional Women International, Chairperson, Anti-Human Trafficking Task Force. The accolades and credits go on forever and ever and ever, longer than a two-hour feature film. This woman is so busy and so connected that we have to take her back from her global realm into a more grassroots kind of uh, talk today to the basics of human trafficking, what it is, how we can maybe become watchdogs in our own community and see situations that may need someone's attention, how we can protect our kids, whether we should live in fear or whether we should just be aware. And awareness can be the key to surviving. So we're going to start by introducing Kelly. Good morning, Kelly, and thank you for joining us here on Fresh Waves. Good day. It's about time we got to chat. (laughs) We've been trying to do this for a while. (laughs) I know, and I'm really grateful to your listeners for hanging in until we could get together, and here we go today. Yeah, I'm very happy about this. When I spoke to Pauline, who is um, with... BPW, which is the business and professional women. Um, I want to say BPW for the rest of the show because if I keep saying the whole thing out, it takes up too much time. Um, but we were talking with Pauline and she said, oh, you've got to talk to Kelly because this is what's happening in human trafficking now. And it has changed. Its colors have changed. Its characteristics have changed. And as I talked to Pauline, I thought, we really need to talk about this because – I was so unaware. I'm a mother of four. How can I be so unaware of human trafficking? I guess I live in this little bubble here up in the north end of York region thinking that, you know, this kind of thing doesn't happen in my community. And maybe, just maybe it does. Well, it's kind of like the wind. (laughs) If you really want to think about human trafficking and if you need a metaphor to get your head around why you don't know what you should know, um, we see the effects of it. We're seeing it in the media. Um, We're hearing people politicize it, make it their influence or currency because they want to be, you know, it's the sexy issue. Everybody wants to be in the know about, but we still are not where we need to be. And so I'm really grateful to talk today. I'm most grateful for an organization that is historic, business and professional women. And I'm sorry, I'm going to, I'm going to, Whatever's in my head, I'm going to float it okay. to the audience. Because without them, um, they actually gave me uh, organizational support. They have a good vision and mission statement. I, I encourage you to go to their international, national, and our uh, provincial and then local web pages. We are in 107 countries. Wow. And we have been doing this work of speaking uh, on behalf of women and girls' issues, and women and girls in all their diversity. And their issues uh, when it comes to equality, equity, all, all of the check boxes about what's necessary for human rights for women and girls and for their happy, healthy lives. And so kudos for BPW, for (laughs) embracing me. Um, And then in 2019, with the work I do for Courage for Freedom, a registered incorporated charity that we founded for this work, um, we lined up together and we started what was called Project En Route. And we started the conversation at the urging of a 16-year-old survivor that I'd been supporting that was just sick and tired of the, the myths and the misunderstandings and the missed applications of resources and the stigmatization that, you know, there, uh, there was posters that have girls in handcuffs. There's posters with girls with duct tape over their mouth and the posters were dark and gloomy and the perpetrators or those that were trafficking them were like headless 
people in the background with their arms folded while the girl's sitting down by a curb. And I remember driving her to court one day across the province and us going into a bathroom and her seeing one of these posters uh, in 2018 and her saying, no wonder why they never found me. I didn't look like that. And therein Mm. started a movement about um, making sure the truth, making sure um, appropriate visual content, appropriate written content was being disseminated to the public because really the public are the eyes and ears. We're those stop sign cameras in our community. And if we base all our awareness information on current trends and information that doesn't have to sound like the National Enquirer version of everything and be fear-based, if it could be intelligent, if it could be accurate, if it could be statistical, if we could make it relevant and informed, and if we could understand that survivors have they're the key holders as stakeholders for the most um in time and appropriate solutions so we went down this journey bpw and us we undertook uh, to do something across the province of ontario and bpw jumped in and let me tell you it blew up in a great way and so we had a rallying cry on July 14th, uh, July 30th, UN Day to End Slavery in Persons, now called UN Day to End Trafficking in Persons. And we stopped in at key on routes all across the province of Ontario. And the reason we did it is because the similarity of what the trafficker and the victim need if they're moving across the province is the same as you and I, if we're travelers. We need gas in the car. <laughs> we need food in our bellies and we need a washroom. Yep. And so it's not that trafficking was happening at the on routes. It was that it could be visible that traffickers and victims and survivors could be spotted potentially at on routes. But more than that, while we were traveling, if we learned four or five signs now also behaviors of what we could see. And at the time, we were just introducing the hotline number for the Canadian Centre to End Human Trafficking. And we were able to put their information with some real-time videos that we created as public safety announcements that were created by minor age survivors on a screen. And people, while they're traveling, could see what's happening across our highway known as the Ontario Corridor or the Dark Highway, then we would educate people about things that were real. And all we asked people to do was put the hotline number in their phone. And if they thought they were seeing something, to call anonymously so that they would be safe and our community would be safe. And that was it. And we rallied that day at 10 key locations out of the 20 some odd on routes. And we asked people to show up and we crowded the on routes that day. Um, All MPPs crossed the floor and signed our sign that I want to eradicate the buying and selling of girls and boys. They agreed to project on route to the eradicate challenge. They um, dropped politics and politicizing anything to come together, to work together, agencies, organizations, stakeholders, everything from grandma's organizations to Red Hat, BPW, to Seroptimus, to Rotary, uh, to Kinsmen, to Lions and Lionesses, Victim Services, uh, Police Services, um, Federal (laughs) um, Support Services municipalities, everybody, just everybody. There was 188 separate organizational representations that day. Um, And we made history. 
and we put people's eyes on the solution. All because of a 16 year old survivor. I was overwhelmed that day. Wow. And as a result, we continue to ask people, go to our page, print the sign, especially with July 30th upcoming, and declare, I want to eradicate the buying and selling of girls and boys and our children. Because well over 95% of those that are trafficked in our community, first of all, are uh, identify as women and girls. And secondly, uh, 72% and the numbers might be a little higher right now in Canada that are being trafficked are 24 years of age and under with well over 60% of them being 18 and under. And the stats also tell us that the average age of recruitment is between 12 and 13. So we need to understand how this affects our community and what we can do about it. And that's why I will not shut up. <laughs> Good for you. Thank goodness that we have someone like you who can advocate for these kids because they're kids. Good Lord of mercy, they're children. Well, and those that aren't, you know, I I do have to speak to this, that those that are adult and are entrenched and still victimized in human trafficking and forced prostitution, we still need to address this. Because we need to know sometimes what the precursors were uh, to put them in a higher um, demographic of risk. Mm-hmm. Because a lot of of us, and I speak as a survivor and also as somebody who has supported over 700, now 753 survivors personally supported in all kinds of ways, um, speaking... For myself and with permission uh, for those that I've been privileged to support, we need people to understand that there are all kinds of tentacles in this issue. It's like <laughs> the uh, the octopus with unlimited arms and tentacles. And so that's why it's a difficult issue to address. Um, it's widespread across demographics. It's widespread across ge- uh, geographic locations. Uh, the policing standards could be different province to province, community to community. And I can give you an example. Um, we really had a good grasp that over 60 percent of all trafficking was being initiated in the province of Ontario historically. Hmm. And we were looking at this and trying to figure out a reason. And so we took a look at our Child and Youth Act, and we understood that we had uh, emancipation guidelines in the province of Ontario. So to your listeners, it basically meant if you were 16, you could um, you could request or demand that you have uh, agency and you're actually an adult at 16. This was used a lot. Um, for those seeking um, birth control, it was actually used. It was initially a good amendment to the Child and Youth Act. It was actually used for those that were coming out, aging out of um, child protective services or children's aid that needed to go into independent living and be able to get some money on their own to continue school, all of that. But as criminals do, They take a look at things, you know, and we think, you know, they just happen into it. No, they're actually very intentional. This is their, this is not a side hustle. This is their full-time gig for money. And so they took a look at the province of Ontario and said, oh, this is a great place to set up turning out or starting out minors in human trafficking. If we can move them from other provinces, from other locations, or even internally, the chance of our arrest is less because they will not have cooperation from the 16, 17, or even 18 year old as a witness. And therefore the police cannot lay charges or initiate activities um, without the full cooperation. And there in itself, all across the spectrum. So we did move the Child and Youth Act. Um, it is amended. The emancipation issue in our Child and Youth Act in the province of Ontario no longer stands when there's suspicion 
of minor age sexual exploitation, a.k.a. Uh, sex trafficking, sextortion, cyber sexual activity, um, child pornography issues, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So we did move the dial. And that's kind of the outlying of what can happen when we listen to survivors, pick a pinpoint focus to work on one issue at a time and move that dial. Uh, helpfully by assisting our governments to understand what's happening boots on the ground in all areas, not just for the police, not just for child protective services, not just for moms and dads, and not just the education system, et cetera, et cetera. But collectively, what's one issue that we can grab a hold of and say, if we work on this, and and do more than just resolution right which is which is the start write the briefs get the government's attention find an ally within the government and start to build relationship because once you send that brief once you send that resolution without the continuation and uh concurrently working on the issue itself it will just become a piece of paper that either will die on the floor uh, in Parliament, whether it's, you know, m- municipal government, provincial government or federal government or global governments, United Nations, you know, uh, European Union, et cetera, et cetera. When we build the relationship to support what our briefs and our resolutions say, and then we have an opportunity to advance the activism it's going to take to not only get those bills done, get those amendments done, but ensure the resources, you know, the funding, the resources, Mm. the outlying stuff, and uh, the deliverables on those documents are actually executed. And so the Ontario strategy was struck in 2019 in our province. It is probably uh, the strongest strategy in Canada. It's been a template to uh, to the credit of our former coordinator um, in that office, Jennifer Richardson, who is also a survivor ally. She had done work in Manitoba, came to Ontario. The timing was right. En route, woke the community up. They supported the governmental uh, will to enact this. We got it down. They resourced it. Um, We didn't like everything that was there. So we went back to the table, had conversations and ensured that there was additional funding um, specific to Indigenous communities and specific funding that was parceled for youth. And then uh, we started to see the applications and the activities And we just started to watch the rollout of funding and activities across our province to strengthen our responses, which still, um, and I hope, you know, by the way, anybody listening, (laughs) I am breathing, (laughs) taking a breath, but I have complex PTSD and how it cycles in my brain is I brain dump. So that's what I'm doing. Uh, to actually manage my own PTSD as a survivor of human trafficking. Can you tell us a little bit about the backstory, like how this all came about? So you are a survivor. Tell us a little bit about that. Well, um, and this is where we're really cautionary when we talk to journalists and interviewers and those that would book us for speaking engagements and even governments, that it has to be the survivors um, in the survivor's agency if they want to speak about their past. Otherwise, you just need to trust that there are things back there locked up in our little black box called our brains that we decide when we pull them out and when we don't. Yep. And so for me, I have a very open um, communication about it. I'm 61. And this is, so I'm now a historic survivor. So the face of trafficking is not anybody that was trafficked previously. It's now who's being trafficked today. Right. And the face is so multidimensional that I try not to take credit and usually don't share any of, not my story, but my lived experience, unless it's beneficial to make a point. 
in what I'm speaking about because we currently are still dealing with something that I experienced. Mm. So I can tell you that it did happen to me that I lived in a community that was um, a high median income community with parents that were professionals. There were things in my household that um, predisposed me to be at higher risk uh, if I was targeted. And I address those in in my book. And uh, when I do webinars or podcasts and I speak specifically about my story, but basically, it's the same framework that we're seeing today. There's just some nuances because of, of IT, computer, social media that just change the face of it a little bit. But the outlying is still the same. And once I was um, engaged and I was being victimized, I didn't know. You know, there's still things that are coming up in my memory that are quite shocking. And, you know, I use humor to deal with a lot of things. And Mm -hmm. some of them are funny and people would not find my humor appropriate, but it's my it's my lived experience. Yeah. But what I've been able to see um, is that the theme is still the same. A lot of times, you know, it, it takes a long time to understand the nuances of this issue. And they change absolutely as fast as we get a handle on it. So let's just so, talk for a minute before you continue about what that kind of trafficking is. Um, Pauline touched on it lightly in the show that we did together. Um, I mean, there's there's people out here who don't understand what we're talking about. They think that human trafficking happens in countries far, far away with kids who are yeah, very, does. very underprivileged. But what does human trafficking look like in a place like... Toronto or Stouffville or or Newmarket or Barrie, Ontario. I mean, what does human trafficking look like in those places? So, do you, you're going to love my answer and probably be a little frustrated. <laughs> my answer to what does it look like is yes. Okay. Whatever it looks like in that moment is a yes. So it could look different in different communities. It can right. look different in different ethnic communities, in geographical communities, in socioeconomic communities. It can look different according to what age of the person that's being targeted. And Mm -hmm. so basically, you know, the baseline human trafficking definition has to do with coercion, exploitation, and manipulation. Those are the three things that are present for it to be considered human trafficking. Sexual exploitation also identifies that uh, in human trafficking, specifically sex trafficking, when you see the word sexual exploitation, you know that it involves a minor. And the exploitation itself can be for money, but it also can be for a lot of other things. It could be for trading uh, housing, to have a place to stay, for comfort for goods or services. And so that's where we have to really sit down. And if we, and for those listening in the province of Ontario, I would encourage you to go to the Ontario Strategy for Human Trafficking, Anti-Human Trafficking website and do a breeze read and then go to the Canadian Centre to End Human Trafficking's webpage and do a breeze read because it'll give you a baseline that allows you to understand that it's about money, it's about power and control, and commodification of persons, basically. Mm -hmm. And so trafficking isn't just about sex, but that's the sexy crime that everybody wants to hear about. They want to, you know, we we like fireworks. So we like to hear things that make us go ooh and ah. (laughs) And then we, we go home. Well, Instead of hearing about ooh and ah, we want to hear the oh, and what about that? So those are the conversations that we try to inspire. And if anybody's listening and has organizations or connections and would like to book us in to speak, we would speak to things specifically. So whether it's somebody in education or in industry, we uh, train officers in law enforcement, corrections, um, trauma-informed practices for hospitals. 
and nurses associations and, 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 and. There's no industry right now that shouldn't have baseline training in this. So with that said, there are, like I said, tentacles in trafficking. So yes, there's sex trafficking. There's cyber trafficking. There's in-person trafficking. There is labor trafficking. There is also uh, other types of trafficking, as in child marriage, forced surrogacy, uh, organs, and the list goes on. So now you know why it's so difficult to just talk about Mm -hmm. and give people an understanding. But what we're seeing, so here's a trend. We're seeing the intersection between some of those things uh, ramped up. So, for example, if somebody's being labor trafficked and they might be in the country already, uh, have citizenship or be landed, or they might be migrant temporary workers, it doesn't really matter, but they're all here in Canada and they might have been forced in order to secure labor, to surrender documents, to pay exorbitant fees, have their family at risk and then not, and then be, um, experiencing horrific living situations, work Mm -hmm. conditions, and have basic human rights violations, labor violations. But on top of that, we're now seeing trends that they additionally are being forced into doing camera work, videos, um, providing pornographic material, and then uh, in-person trafficking. So, you know, it's the worst two for one sale that we could be having as Canadians. And no communities are immune to it because our connection through the Internet uh, just means that we're available. Mm -hmm. And the horrific part of this is that we're also available not only to buyers of um, buyers of persons and their commodified goods. But as a crime, we're also available globally to be selling this. And and case in point is conversations around things like MindGeek and Pornhub, which I actually had an opportunity to sit as an expert witness and speak to the Senate on. So it's like pick an issue. If we come to talk to people, we like to say, first of all, don't compete with another community that you're a hub. If you ask if you're a hub, the answer is yes. If you ask how it's happening, the answer is yes. If you ask what the trends are, the answer is yes. The trends shift. The hubs shift. and But the means does not shift. And that is somebody is being bought and sold uh, for the benefit of somebody else that's coercing, manipulating, and exploiting them. And, you know, the statistics about how much somebody that's classically known as a pimp or a madam can make off of somebody is, you know, around, around 200 K a year tax free. So it it has surpassed uh, the sale of drugs in Canada as uh, the number two um, crime uh, as far as uh, money goes, you know, what's being made in it. That should be concerning. So Mm -hmm. one of the questions that um, we like to ask communities is why are communities asking themselves who's buying? Do Are we still living in that misogyny, patriarchy, colonized, historic bias that all of us have? Every single one of us has just because of the nature of our history. Are we still believing that it's somebody's right um, to enact um, crimes of modern day slavery? Do we still believe it's the right for somebody? You know, we we talk about things in our history conversationally, even phrases like rule of thumb, where it was okay to beat your wife if the stick was, you know, no longer than your thumb, no wider than your thumb. Mm. And we still are entrenched in those biases that are deep seated in all of us. And so. You know, we we have these conversations. So, you know, well, if it's kids, we can get all excited about it and we want to fight 
and initiate a movement, which is kind of the low hanging fruit because it's easy for everybody to agree we need to protect children. But I would challenge people to ask yourself, first of all, what is the difference between 11.59 p.m. when they are 18 and 12.01 a.m. when they're 19? Because we also understand in the psychology of life that full brain formation to be able to mitigate risk and be good decision makers is not happening until women, young girls, women in all their diversity are 24 and young men or boys in all their diversity are 26. And yet we're saying between 19 and the age of um, maturation, brain maturation, to keep themselves safe, that it's okay to be commodified whether it's self-commodification or trafficking. Have we lost our collective way as a society? I think the answer is yes. Where's our our civic duty? Well, there isn't any. And where's our moral compass? And I'm not talking about QAnon, and I'm not talking about, you know, religiousizing and faith-basing everything. You know, I, I agree there's space and place for all of that. But we have to understand that this is a common space. And so we have to have a moral compass, especially about how we want our children and youth treated. But very often, it's indicative of our behavior as adults. And so if we look at some of the UN and the governing documents that as Canadians, we've subscribed to and are actually ratified here as founding members at the United Nations, there's something called CEDAW. And under the rules of CEDAW, if we take it in a baseline and we read it like this, that my right to do things as a Canadian do not supersede my collective responsibility for societal safety. Period. So just because I decide that uh, like I'm allergic to red lights doesn't mean I can drive around and run a red. Because it puts community at risk. So I don't know what all the answers are, but I'm happy to have the conversations and to continue the dialogue. But we also have to understand that listening to survivors and even survivors being given opportunity to heal, um, to start to enjoy their efficacy and their self-directed past and um Ensure that there's a code of ethical practice, uh, ensuring the basic human rights of victims and survivors. You know, that's the work that BPW uh, Canada, BPW in Ontario and BPW. You know, yesterday I had a task force meeting globally um, as the task force chair for this issue internationally, uh, giving oversight with BPW. And we have to come together in our common humanity to pinpoint issues that we'd like to address to move the dial. And so sometimes what somebody thinks should be the focus gets left out. And sometimes in survivor circles, that's very difficult. Sometimes in people's communities where there are do-gooders that actually really want to help, but they don't want to follow but they want to lead into spaces that they're not qualified and they do not have lived experience to speak to actually harms the movement. We can't stand behind the curtain like the great and wonderful Oz. No, that's true too. We need to pull back the curtain and come together to have those conversations to actually start to listen to what's behind that. So, and because that's fear-based, right? Mm-hmm. Yes, it is. So You're right. So what is it? about those that makes you think this is an us and them. And that's why where I will intersect my lived experience because I came from a community with million dollar homes. I was with parents that were professionals. Uh, my father being a CEO at a very high level, well-respected in government and community. And this was never thought that I would ever be a victim. When we understand it's not an us and them, 
it's a we, and I'm not alluding to any organizational we. <laughs> no. But when we understand our common civil responsibility to one another as good humans fighting for humanity and human rights, then we are no longer polarized. And that makes us dangerous to criminals. And that makes us allies to survivors. We might not get everything we want out of the conversation. It might not be done the way we believe it should be done. And there in itself, (laughs) people need to reread the definition of collaboration. (laughs) Because a lot of work that's being done is actually collective. That everybody wants to have a say and everybody has focuses and you end up with too many activities and taking off too many big chunks and your committees fail and the energy in your coalition dies. And the issue gets diluted. The issue gets diluted in the process. And people take it personally when their ideas are not prioritized, but I'm sorry, how do you think survivor feel when for (laughs) since 2019, we've been telling you how to do this and you're still not resourcing it the way you're taking ownership from my lived experience And you're working on projects just to fund the big box stores because they have to change the shingles on their staff's um, description of their job on their door because there's a funding shortage. I'm sorry. That is not collaboration. Yeah. Collaboration means we come in the room. We listen to survivors and by end, we actually qualify uh, survivors. We understand how many you know, years out, what kind of support they would usually, usually need, because there's always variances. And at what point um, is there a capacity for them to take on key leadership roles and actually drive the movement by us vetting who the IGOs, NGOs, and qualified stakeholders are according to our standards under a code of ethical behavior Mm -hmm. to ensure our human rights are not violated in your zealousness to provide services that were not forthcoming to us in our past. Mm -hmm. You know, survivors are very angry that our community did not keep us safe. Our community is responsible for the things that happened to us. Yes, it is. (laughs) We have to stop victim blaming. That's a whole other podcast. Yeah, it is. Absolutely. Absolutely. For sure. So sorry, I'm getting a little heated. <laughs> yep, that's okay. So let me tell you, I I heard from my technical producer here, Jason Rumball, who's been with the show since, I don't know, at least 10 years. And he said, um, wow, have you heard of this new movie, The Sound of Freedom? It's all about trafficking. And he started talking to me about this, this movie, the concept of it, because he hasn't seen it, but he was reading all this stuff online about it. And I said to him, hang on a second. It sounds like they're actually sensationalizing and making money off of the actual problem. Where are the proceeds of this film going? If the 100% of the proceeds are going into the organizations that are fighting human trafficking, then I'm all for it. If this is a movie to make money for Hollywood producers so that they can live in mansions and have large swimming pools and big parties, then it's exploiting the very issue that they say is being exploited. They're also making money from the victims of this horrid thing of human trafficking. So I I honestly can say that I have no background in this. I don't know where the money is going. I've been not able to find anything about it because I keep looking for it and I can't find the answers to those questions. So I find the film problematic in that sense. And so far I haven't seen it and I don't know if I will. So I can only answer as a survivor. And somebody that struggles to fund um, unrestricted dollars that go directly to victim survivors across Canada. I get calls from other agencies that are funded here in Canada that they've spent that area of their budget, but they have a girl and they need to get her out right now and she needs to go to a hotel. And if somebody needs that verified, I can very easily do that. Um Also, you know, when somebody's been found out that they're a human trafficking 
survivor and their job is now violating their human rights under labor laws and requesting they do an STD and an, and an HIV test because they're part of their, you know, employee assistance program and they're worried about their insurance liabilities. Like the violations are crazy. Here's what I will say. I am not a film critic. I uh, was introduced to the work of um, the main character in the movie when I, by invitation, attended a big um, speaking engagement to learn more about speaking publicly, because believe it or not, I was kind of gobsmacked and didn't have a lot to say for a lot of years. Now my mouth, uh, my brain leaks out my mouth. But I went to um, an event with Tony Robbins and got a chance to meet him and VIP with him. Somebody paid my way and made sure I did that as a way to pour into me because I pour everything I have into our organization, Courage for Freedom. And through that um, was sent an email or something. And he made the commitment to introduce me to the work of Tim, the character in the movie. And so I followed their work, but I will, and I will say this, the work that's represented in the movie is historic. So you figure how long ago this has happened, how long it took to make the movie. So I don't know, seven, 10 years, the work that they're doing, I can't refute. That's not my job. I do ask good questions. You've asked good questions. So is the appeal for this? just to drive funds back to an organization. I don't know. I don't have time to research that. Mm -hmm. But anybody giving money to any organization fighting human trafficking should ask these questions in Canada. So you ready? Mm -hmm. Number one, is it just a historic representation with no contact to grassroots boots on the ground activities necessary and impactful today? Mm Mm-hmm. So even if it's not a grassroots organization doing the work, do they have funds filtered and fueled right to grassroots to ensure survivors get the money? Number one. Number two, are they just providing baseline awareness for the community by being on a speaker circuit when there's a lot of awareness and education for free in our communities? Mm -hmm. Number three. Are they doing the work? What percentage of their money pays administrative costs, salaries? What percentage of the money actually goes to moving the dial? Yeah. Moving the dial both at grassroots, at intermediate levels, at government levels, et cetera, et cetera. And is that person actually working ethically by you know, I, I've challenged CEOs to give up their chair for a survivor leader that's just as qualified for their job. Do they take you up on it? Um, I started my own organization. <laughs> and I don't recommend people do it. It's very difficult. Uh, there's a lot of toxicity. You take a lot, you know, there's a lot of snipering. Mm-hmm. It, it costs you to do this. Yes, it does. And also that all survive there's a lot more survivors out there that don't identify and i i really if you're listening to this and you're a survivor of human trafficking <laughs> i don't blame you yeah but there is a you know there are platforms and there's things happening in canada that are very valuable i'm actually part of a national ethical movement right now working with allies ceos organizational allies that are survivor informed at the highest level that will give up their talking space in order to insert me and support me in order to ensure that we are not um, just brought in uh, to make the presentation at the front of a speaking engagement and then left off of panels because they want to talk to the people in the organizations about what they're going to do on our behalf without consulting us. We shouldn't be consulted. We need to be leading. Yeah. And when we are consulted, we actually need to be re- remunerated appropriately for the work that we're doing. If one more person calls me up and offers me a Tim Hortons card, 
when if you look at the caliber and the level of my speaking, my consultancy, and not just mine, a lot of other survivors that went ahead of me and paid the price for me to have a platform today, I stand on their shoulders with gratitude. They're the pioneers. Mm -hmm. And those that pioneered it are not the head of organizations that are not survivors. They're not. The pioneers in the movement are the survivors whose lived experience gave them the currency and the consultant information to put their organizations together. It's an egregious conversation, necessary, and we will not pull back from this because you cannot take, it's nothing, it's nothing with us without us. Yeah, and I think that there are people who are traumatized by their experience who don't want the limelight and they want to just Absolutely. have everything go away so that they can live whatever they consider to be a normal life and move on and move from it. For you, it seems to be, to me, looking at it, I see such bravery in choosing to stay in that world and fight <laughs> fight for a better world because that's know, exactly bravery, what you're doing. Bravery and stupidity might be very close in, in their definitions and nope. addictions. I won't days. I won't allow you to go there because when well, I use the language, language is very important. And it, it is, is brave. Sometimes it I is say brave. I'm stupid like a fox. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I learned this, uh, you know, I was very fortunate to hang out with a lot of people and just see personalities and I I am a high I driven person that's understands now understands the value of sitting back and just acting like I'm not the sharpest knife in the drawer mm. and letting people talk until I hear what I need to to be able to build that collaboration and have us anchor on common humanity yeah to pinpoint a focus and move and I will say that that has been one of the draws of this movie like it, love it, link it to different issues or whatever. Um, it has this conversationally active. And so we That's a very not, good point. Well, and somebody very wise, I have a friend, uh, he's a mayor in St. Thomas, Ontario, who used to chair my board when he was actually an MP and you know, he led the integrity sector of our government. So he worked across the lines with everybody and was well respected. His name's Joe. And he taught me, Kelly, that any press is good press. If it, if you allow it to start the conversation. So regardless of what anybody thinks of this movie or the activities, first, I do credit those that were fearless and did uh, give opportunity for survivors to exit. I will not take away from that. Mm hmm. To understand the personal sacrifice and the PTSD and the uh, vicarious trauma because they're not a survivor, but they're survivor allied trauma that they experienced from what they saw, heard and experienced. Thank you for what you also endured for the benefit of survivors. But I would also say that uh, things are changing. Um, the ability to do things in a certain way is shifting. And the other thing is people have to understand, regardless of whether they're watching this movie anywhere across the world, we can agree that this crime is happening and we are not going to stand for it. So I point people back to our hashtag eradicate challenge that our movement, our common humanity in this movement, regardless of what you think of an actor or the movie or the film company or, you know, the color of the text on the, on the credits, who knows? Like people are, we're ridiculous sometimes. Yep, absolutely. <laughs> but if we look at the, at the message that says get in, involved, get engaged, I would say reach out. And find out what's happening. Call us at Courage for Freedom. Go to courageforfreedom.org. We are aligned with people all across Canada. We will point you towards the Canadian Centre and allied organizations that we 
would suggest are using codes of ethical practice in ensuring the human rights of victims and survivors. We're not tokenizing stories. We're not becoming uh, social media influencers in our own right and taking credit for survivors. We want to point you to organizations um, who, if you did check on them financially, you know, for us, 5% of our costs are administrative. I volunteer my time. It's a really crappy retirement plan. Mm-hmm. I've uh, got the same also, plan. <laughs> but it also keeps my voice available to speak to things in government that I don't have to declare conflicts of interest because of funding. So I've helped others grant right, receive um, huge amounts of grants and money and just made suggestions and work together. And the purity in 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 myself, I, you know, I have to be able to put my head down every night, but I'm not going to criticize a movie that's going to uh, spark conversations, good, bad, or indifferent. Yeah. I, I'm not going to tell people what to think or what to do uh, because that's a controlled state. But I am going to say, please don't politicize this issue and miss the message that this is happening. And then find out what it looks like where you are. And then figure out how to get involved. And the first thing that I would say, and I hope that you can um, do a cut and pan this in, put the Canadian Centre to End Human Trafficking's telephone number in your phone. It's anonymous. If you think you see something, call. If you're right, hooray. If you're wrong, they have to answer the phone anyways. Yeah. (laughs) They're paid to answer the phone. But if you're right and you don't call, It could be very harmful for somebody that is within your eyesight. Please don't physically reach out and try to do this on your own. You're not qualified. Right. Um, You could endanger somebody by even making extended eye contact with them, trying to slip them a card, trying to approach or go over to them. There are usually eyes on them. Um, And even talking to somebody could cause them to, to endure punitive um, repercussions, something punitive as a result. It's not good. And we don't have to fear um, if we see something calling in Um, there, there, you know, those that are trafficking are not looking to come by and snatch you and throw you in a van. That's typically, you know, that's the take a movie. We're over that now. Yeah. Although I like watching Liam Neeson. Sorry. He's <laughs> Irish. I'm a little Irish. I'm Kellish, right? Yeah. Kelly, very Irish. But if we understand that usually the white van is not circulating in our community, it's usually relationship based and it starts with engagement. Sometimes it uses peers to draw other peers in, invitations to parties, um, just conversations, building alliances, tugging on people's heartstrings. Yeah, and you know, internet, right? The um, social yeah. media where absolutely, I've heard people you know, say, well, you know, they're, they're constantly looking for someone on the internet who said, I hate my parents. Yeah, what 14-year-old hasn't ever said that they hate their parents? Oh, my gosh. What adult hasn't said that? <laughs> <laughs> And I'm not laughing at the situation, but I'm laughing at the irony of how vulnerable many of these children, and we're talking, you know, the under 21s or in what you were just saying, under 24, um, they are vulnerable because they do have these emotional spurts and they, they're they questioning the world around them and they feel like no one's listening. And then when someone who is a predator says, I'll listen. I'll love you. Mm. Well, and how ridiculous are we thinking that we're just going to educate every young person and, you know, kind of like wash our hands of this issue. It's done. Yeah. We've done our diligence. How many of us, when we were teaching our children how to cross the road safely, stood at the corner, lectured them, pointed to the road, pointed to the cars, pointed to the other side, and then pushed them off the curb. (laughs) Did we not handhold? And while we're crossing, start to instruct and tell them why? Mm -hmm. Did we not then again also handhold and continue along till we understood 
that they had agency to mitigate the risk at a crosswalk. Yeah. So until a young person, their brain, their neurology, remember 24, 26, yep. can fully mitigate that risk. The partnerships with adults as peer supports, you know, statistics tell us that in order for a child to be successful in life, they need one secure attachment. They don't say it's a parent. Sometimes it's not. I have young persons that their secure attachment ended up being me for a season or a children's aid worker or a social worker or a police officer. And we also have to be very careful of transference of trauma bonds yeah, and uh, obsessive compulsive relationship bonds. Like that's why the work is so um, demanding. Right. You have to understand those nuances or actually you just create another layer of problems. Right. But how many of us, when we took our driver's license, you know, back in the day for us, I got a learner's permit called a 365 and I had one year to drive around in a car and figure out how to drive. But anyways, there's an odd concept, isn't it? We're not that idiotic. But still, if you figure we hand somebody information about human trafficking. And it's like the MTO, the Ministry of Transportation of Ontario Manual. And we read it cover to cover and we go in and we write our test and we're informed. We're not practiced. And so we do not take the book, write our test and go out and hit them, hit the pedal to the mat on the 401 or drive on the gardener in downtown traffic. Yeah. We don't. It, yep. We have to practice and experience and be guided. And so that's one of the things I encourage with um, collaboration is those people that have those experiences, lived experiences, that are intersectional to the issue that you want to focus on in your community. I don't really care what you want to focus on. I care with this, what the survivors have asked us to focus on. Like we started with Project En Route that is now Project Maple Leaf because at the incredible writing skills of Julia Drydeck, the uh, ED from the Canadian Centre, we continued that conversation through a Globe and Mail article to understand Canada is the corridor. And there are corridors everywhere in the globe mm -hmm. that are like pipelines to human commodities. And with that, how are we going to navigate that together? So we are challenging people for July 30th. We are saying, join what is now called Project Interclusion. And that means that there's an inclusion that's intertwined. And we have now incorporated and advanced the leadership and conversations with cultural sensitivity and, and bias analysis to include our information in 30 languages. Because wow. some of the new trends are seeing our communities, our, our, you know, our common civil people that we live with every day um, in community that are from different experiences, different genders, different faiths, different ethnicities, and diverse experiences, mm -hmm. that they are being targeted more heavily because they're at greater risk to not have the supports or a higher measure of shame within their cultural context. Wow. And if you want to know what that looks like in real time, I'm sorry, but I'm going to say this. It looks like hot petite Asians being advertised. It looks like Ukrainian war compliant girls being advertised for sale. Mm -hmm. It's egregious. It is horrid. And so those are the partnerships that we forged working with the Canadian Federation of University Women the National Council of Women, uh, having intersection with uh, ANWA, 
and working with the grannies and the aunties in our indigenous communities, working with the National Jewish Women's Council. Oh, you know, I'm forgetting somebody. <laughs> working with Seroptimus, working with Rotary, working with lionesses, working with anybody that wants to listen about what survivors will be asking our communities to do. Mm -hmm. We're asking. Um, sorry, it's making me very emotional. Yeah, we're asking them to keep our children safe. We're asking you to follow the leadership of survivors. Quit creating solutions for us that we already know aren't effective. Yeah. Please don't do a pop-up or start-up or think you're going to take on this issue to build your own social influence or use this as your political or popularity currency because you're trafficking our lived experience. Exactly. Well, Kelly, I am so happy that we finally got together. We've been trying to put this together for over a month. And at times where you've probably thought in your busy schedule while you were in Europe and you were all over the place and me being here thinking, oh, I want to be at the cottage. And I'm thinking, you know, we we really persevered through a lot of stuff in order to get this done. In order to Absolutely. do this interview, I've traveled yeah. over 700 kilometers <laughs> to try and make sure that we get this done. And I think it's really important that we've had this conversation today. And I look forward to having more conversations in the future with you so that we can get a better understanding of this issue and a more realistic understanding of the issue and that we can direct people who want to get involved to a way that they can effectively get involved. Absolutely. There are there are minuscule ways to get involved, like putting something in your phone. I also need people that know how to type and look at social media I'm not going to give you access to survivors uh, unless you have uh, a very certain set of skills and you can guarantee two years of your life. Yeah. I, I'm, you know, I just can't uh, re-victimize a girl to become uh, build a relationship with somebody that's going to not be there for her once again when that's usually a survivor's experience. Yep. So Understood. You can call. You can look up courageforfreedom.org. Um, you can call the numbers that are there and you can email us at info at courage for freedom dot org. And we might take a little bit of time because we might be out in the car driving somebody to court away from a bad situation, back to family, to an airport, from an airport. We don't have a checky box of things we can and can't do. We have the opportunity and the freedom to engage with survivors in real time with what they want. And I do use a Horses That Heal program that we um, initiated that really extends wellness immediately and safety um, that's, that's trauma created. And anybody ever understand how expensive it is to have these pasture ornaments? We do need donations. I do need to continue to operate in freedom. Uh, it's tax receivable. <laughs> We're reputable. <laughs> you can check us out. Um, so you use but, horses in therapy? Yes. Wow. Hmm. And they are actually what helped me start healing at 12 years of age from child sexual abuse. But that's another podcast. That's another podcast for another day. But suffice it to say that there are therapy horses and ther therapy horse programs that have great success rates. But if they're generalized trauma supports, they're actually not helpful for human trafficking survivors. Hmm. And I'll leave you with this. Kudos to all those that are working in anti-gender-based violence, anti-femicide, domestic violence arenas. That work is vitally important. It does intersect with our work, but I will caution community that human trafficking trauma, it shares a lot of common pieces, but it has about five pages of additional trauma needs on top of the trauma of gender-based violence. And so that's why we need our own spaces. We need our own coalitions. 
We can't become conflated and lost in the bigger issues. We need our own space because survivors historically have not gotten what they needed. We right. only got what we thought would help as a Band-Aid solution. A, a woman or girl that's been trafficked, if she doesn't have a place to stay to exit, she very often gets put in a woman's shelter. But the, the, the general issues of women that are in the shelter are very different. Yes. And they often... Um, the needs of the human trafficking survivor need to be person centric, not program centric. And every time we aren't able to give, and I'll use the feminine pronoun because that's the majority of my work, although currently I have two male survivors I'm working with and supporting their self direction. But when all we have to offer is you can join the other programs and we're informed about what happened to you. But we can't take the time or spend resources to individually address this with you. We are failing them and once again blaming them for our shortcomings societally to provide care for them when we fail to protect them in our community. Public Safety Canada guarantees two things to people on the soil in Canada. The first is safety. The second is happiness. And so with that, we are going to be reviewing um, Public Safety Canada's National Action Strategy and hopeful to have a consultant voice going forward to help them in their activities as they revitalize that and as we revitalize our Ontario strategy and call to every province to also have a strategy. Thank you so much. Um, sorry for over talking. Not no, sorry. You're not. Do not apologize for that. We've and learned a lot this this morning, and I'm very, very, very fortunate. Please to reach you. out to business and professional women by googling them and get involved with them organizationally. This is an all hands on deck issue, and there's lots of other benefits in club in the club um, camaraderie and business growth, personal growth, and personal support. Yeah, very worthwhile organization. And you do not have to be a professional, quote-unquote, woman. You can be anybody. You don't have to have a university degree. You don't have to be an engineer or a scientist or a doctor. You can be whoever you are. And you can be those things, too. The nice thing about BPW, it's not either or, it's and also. And also. What a great motto. (laughs) Thank you so much. Um, My level of comfort and being able to bring my back-end loader and just dump to your audience is apparent. As I listen back to this, I'll probably hear it in myself. And I look forward to the conversations of tomorrow. Oh, me too. Thanks so much for joining us this morning and um, good luck in all of your endeavors going forward. Keep us informed. Keep us aware. We need Absolutely. that awareness. Thank you so much. Thanks, lots of love, Kelly. Lots of regards. Respect. That's been Fresh Waves. We'll be back again next week, so stay tuned for more Fresh Waves. I'm your host, Bren Masson, wishing you a fabulous day. <laughs>